Thank you, Dean. Um, my name is Teresa Sayas Caban, and I will be moderating this teleconference for you. We are very excited that you're able to join us. We have a great uh, set of speakers who will be discussing managing change to achieve successful health IT implementation. Before we begin, I just want to confirm that neither myself nor any of the presenters had any conflicts to report. And I want to remind I want to remind folks that the presentation slides will be available in two weeks on our website at healthit.jhrq.gov forward slash events. Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Pascal Carrion, who is Proctor and Gamble Baskin Professor in Total Quality in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering and the Director of the Center for Quality and Productivity Improvement at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she leads the Systems Engineering Initiative for Patient Safety, or SEEP. SEEP is an interdisciplinary research program that brings together researchers from human factors and systems engineering with researchers from medicine, surgery, nursing, pharmacy, and health services research. Dr. Carrion's research aims at, model, aims at modeling, assessing, and improving healthcare work systems, including health IT, in order to improve both patient and employee outcomes. So I'd like to turn it over um, for, to Dr. Carrion to lead us off with the first presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, change management in health IT implementation from a human factors uh, and systems engineering viewpoint. Um, as all of you know, uh, health IT is a major change, and as a major change, it needs to be managed. And so there are a number of uh, approaches that have been proposed uh, to change management, including some that have been applied to health IT implementation. So for instance, um, Porter's uh, change management model is the one that uh, was used in that report on change management implementation in EHR implementation, sorry, change management in EHR implementation uh, sponsored by the National Learning Consortium. That slide shows a number of other uh, change management approaches from the organizational viewpoint, looking at resistance to change and what is it, what are the factors that um, influence resistance to change. Change can be stressful because it produces uncertainty, therefore there are models to change management that focus on, ch on stress management and coping. Uh, and of course, the issue of managing your project, your timeline, your steering committee, your management team, and so on. I'm going to be focusing on change management from a human factors uh, and systems engineering uh, viewpoint. For human factors engineer, the important issues of SIT are related to the design, first the design of the technology, and then the implementation of the technology. Uh, from the design viewpoint, um, we are very concerned about uh, ensuring that the technology is usable and in useful, that people can actually uh, use it to support their work uh, and their workflow, that it has the right functionalities uh, and that the technology fits in the work uh, that they are doing. Uh, we're also concerned about um, the implementation, the process used to uh, implement the technology. Uh, Kosh in the 2004 paper talked about, I think, a total of about nine principles uh, for health IT implementation. And those uh, principles um, are um, things that you can, you healthcare organizations uh, can use uh, in the implementation of the technology to ensure that uh, your users are going to be more accepting of the uh, technology. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of these design and implementation principles uh, of uh, human factors, uh, but putting the technology in the context of a systems approach. Uh, from a human factors and systems engineering viewpoint, the technology is only part of a larger uh, system. And uh, this slide here shows one example of a model that can be used to describe the system. Very often we just talk about the system and we don't describe it. That model of the work system actually allows you to define the elements of the uh, system. 
So there is a technology that is used by different users. They're using the technology to perform different tasks. Those tasks are performed in an environment, in a physical environment, as well as an organizational environment. From a systems viewpoint, therefore, um, we're concerned about uh, the technology and its interactions with the other elements of the system. Then we can use that systems approach to try to anticipate what may be the impact of the technology. And finally, uh, we need to think about that concept, concept of emergence and uh, anticipation. So in the rest of my presentation, I'm going to talk about these uh, three different points. So first of all, um, it's important to understand that the technology will influence the work system and be influenced by the work system. Um, it is for sure that your technology is going to change who does what, when, so what tasks are being done, for instance, who's entering orders in the system, uh, so the distribution of tasks. Uh, we be affected by the technology. Uh, the physical environment, very often that's something that we tend to forget, and I will show you some examples of interaction between the technology and the physical environment. We know that the technology also influences and is influenced by how people work together, how healthcare professionals and other workers interact how healthcare professionals interact with patients and their caregivers. Um, health IT is just one of many different technologies, and so we need to think about the integration of all the different technologies. In anticipation of uh, the technology implementation, we need to make sure that people have the right skills to use the technology, so thinking ahead about training, but even after the technology is implemented, what kind of refresher training or new training uh, do we need to provide to our users? The technology is also going to affect the way work is organized. And very often, you see the health IT being implemented in concert with other changes, such as uh, team-based care or the patient-centered medical home. The next uh, slide shows different pictures of the technology health IT in use, um, and that would help you understand how the technology uh, may influence uh, different aspects of the uh, work system. In that uh, first slide here, on the upper left uh, corner, uh, you see a team of um, healthcare professionals, probably an attending, maybe some um, physicians in training, uh, maybe nurses and other uh, clinicians. It seems to be used uh, to look up some information and share information and have a discussion uh, about uh, that information. As you can see in that slide, the physical environment has a big impact on uh, the use of the technology, is there enough space, what is the layout like, uh, the task and how the tasks are uh, performed differently with the technology, the organization, maybe the use of that technology allows uh, people to share information and so on. The uh, second uh, example um, here is all of a picture of an emergency department. And here what you see is a lot of different technologies. And you may wonder whether there is actually enough space for all the physical devices, the different pieces of hardware. So again, in thinking about the health IT in the system, you need to uh, look at the physical space as well as the other technology. And that picture at the bottom is also an example of how uh, the technology is influenced and uh, influences uh, the physical environment, uh, and in particular, the space. This is a picture that I took in an intensive care unit where uh, physicians as well as nurses were using laptops. Each one had a laptop 
uh, to access the EHR. Therefore, they needed space to put their technologies when they did not uh, need it. The um, other two examples um, uh, examples of two defense studies. The one on the upper um, right corner is a study uh, done by Maurice et al., published in 2011, of a cardiac ICU, um, looking at uh, the use of the EHR uh, before, uh, sorry, four months after the implementation as well as 12 months. This is a picture that was taken four months after the implementation, and so you see the different uh, roles, number one is the bed nurse, number two is the pharmacist, number three the head nurse, number four is the attending, and number five is a resident. Um, and as you can see, there does not seem to be a lot of sharing of the screen. Not all of the members of the team have access to the information on the screen. And actually, in that study, Morrison et al. look at the implementation of the technology 12 months later and the team had adapted the use of the technology to make sure that everybody on the team uh, could see the, the screen and share information. The last uh, picture on that um, slide is from a study conducted by Hassan and Montague looking at primary care um, uh, visits, so a patient visiting their uh, primary care physician. On that particular picture, what you see is active information sharing. The physician has turned around the screen, and the physician and the patient are both looking at the screen and making sense of the data that's on the screen. In that particular study, Hassan and Montague uh, found two other patterns um, uh, of use of the computer. Uh, one was passive information sharing, where the physician did not actively turn the screen around, but the patient, if the patient could uh, lean forward, they could see the screen. Uh, and the uh, third uh, pattern was technology withdrawal, where the uh, physician actually did not want the patient uh, to, see the, to see the screen. Uh, so these pictures are just illustration of how the technology influences and is influenced uh, by different elements of the work system. So how can we use that information? So that's the second point of that presentation, is you can actually use a range of different methods, human factors, uh, engineering methods, to anticipate what the new work system with a new technology is going to be. And a key principle of the approach is to actually understand the work that people are doing, the work and the workflow. So it's that idea of work as imagined, or as we think is happening, versus the work as it actually done. So the idea is we need to understand the work, the actual work, uh, so that we can design the technology to support what people do. Uh, and this is a key principle of the uh, user-centered uh, design approach. Uh, this um, shows an example of um, kind of work as imagined, a linear uh, process of a um, uh, workflow where a physician writes an order, a pharmacist verifies it, the unit clerk delivers the order, and the nurse administers the order. In that study, Chang et al., um, I think collected data from about 50 different uh, people working in a medical surgical unit. And of course, they did not find the workflow to be a linear workflow. Sometimes the nurse initiated uh, an order. Uh, sometimes there was a conversation back and forth between the physician and the nurse about the order. Sometimes there was a conversation back and forth between the physician uh, and the pharmacist. Uh, so this is the difference between work as imagined in my head or in the head of the designer and the work the way it's actually uh, being done. Um, in the French ergonomics tradition, the idea is to differentiate between what's called the prescribed task and the actual uh, activity. 
So Le Ply, the French ergonomist, that published that paper in 1989 uh, and really emphasized the need to look at the activity, what they call the activity, that is the walk the way it's actually being done. And on that graph, you can see two different methods of getting at the activity. One method may be a researcher or a systems analyst uh, doing some observations, for instance, of the walk and then you develop some representation of how the task or the work system is being implemented. Uh, or you can talk to the worker, uh, to the physician, to the nurse, to the patient about what is the work that, that they are doing. These are two different representations of uh, the actual uh, activities. Um, there are a lot of many different methods uh, for doing workflow and workflow analysis. That slide shows you um, really a small sample of different books, the Handbook of Human Factors and Ergonomics. There is a book on human factors methods, um, just examples of books uh, in my discipline that talk about different methods for analyzing work and workflow. I also wanted to mention the EHRQ workflow assessment for SIT uh, toolkit. So you have the address here. Um, and I'm not sure whether you can see it, uh, but if you click uh, on this one here, all workflow tools, then you can learn about uh, different methods for analyzing uh, workflow and workflow analysis. When you do your workflow and your workflow analysis, you need to make sure you understand the users of the technology. And you might think that may be a simple question, but if you think back about the primary care example, the physician was one user, the patient was also one user. So you need to think about the work and the workflow of the physician and the patient using together uh, the technology. So sometimes the users are just single people, or sometimes they are groups of people or teams working together. And finally, the third point that I have is uh, the idea of emergence as a systems property. So it's really important that you all do your planning, your project management, your work and your workflow analysis. If you want and you have the expertise, you might do some type of proactive risk assessment. And all of these activities are really important in anticipation of the big change that represents uh, health IT implementation. But I'm sorry to tell you that we cannot really predict everything about the technology implementation. Once the technology is implemented, it's being used, it's being adapted, or people adapt to the technology. And so sometimes you hear the term of work around. Um, and so we actually see that in a lot of different uh, situations. So this is just one example of um, do not uh, keep, uh, do not walk on the grass. Uh, and you can just speak your language. I think there's five or six different languages. So how can you ignore that sign? How can you walk on the grass? And actually, it's done all the time. Uh, the picture on the right side is a picture on our campus of uh, faculty, staff, students, visitors actually taking a shortcut. Uh, why would you want to walk all the way around uh, when you can actually uh, enter the building a lot faster uh, and more quickly, especially if you're running late for a meeting or for a class? Uh, so that's really that concept of emergence or adaptation uh, that uh, is key to a systems approach. And I just wanted to give you an example um, that was reported by Charlene Weir in that study on the use of computerized patient documentation in the VA. They interviewed or did some focus groups, I think, with more than 100 physicians, nurses, and administrative staff. And I want to call your attention to actually the first finding, uh, which I find really interesting. Uh, and it highlights the way that users uh, use the documentation system 
more than just documentation. They actually used it for a lot of uh, other uh, communications. Um, so you just have to be ready that uh, things like that uh, are going to happen. And uh, this is really the difference uh, between what we call an episodic change and a continuous change. So for instance, many of the change management approaches that I talked about earlier are really about a big change, uh, getting ready for it, uh, making sure that people are going to use the technology, uh, using change agents to motivate uh, users. But uh, Carl Weick and James Quinn in that 1999 paper talked about the important idea of continuous change. Change is emergent. It happens over time. Uh, it's continuous. Uh, and what that means is that you need to be ready uh, to be surprised that there are things that are going to happen after the technology is implemented, and you need to capture those uh, things, those changes, those small, tiny changes, and make sure that you use that um, as part of your individual uh, and uh, organizational learning. Therefore, uh, you need people who are going to make sense of uh, what happens. So in conclusion, it's a system. The technology is only part of the system. You need to understand the rest of the system. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do uh, to analyze the ronk and the ronk flow uh, in anticipation of the system. But unfortunately, that doesn't stop there. You need to continue that ronk and ronk flow analysis after the technology is implemented. Expect to be surprised. Sorry, even as an engineer, I would want to say we can plan everything, but the reality is no. Emergence is a key systems property. Therefore, you need to engage in continuous improvement and learning. This slide shows the list of references of papers that I have cited uh, in my presentation, and here is my contact information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carrion. Our next speaker this afternoon is Dr. Lee Green who is a practicing family physician and leads a, law, a research program using cognitive and organizational science tools and theories to study clinical translation and primary care transformation at the team, practice, and system level. His research focuses on how experts and teams update their knowledge, change practices, and routines, and how social and technical systems can be designed and implemented to support rapid, reliable implementation of new knowledge and practice. He has long been involved at the national level in practice guideline development and implementation and works with a number of regional public and private health systems as well as consulting on guidelines, implement, guideline implementation, performance measurement, and improvement in the U.S. and Canada. Dr. Green? Thank you. So I'm going to set the background for our project before I present it by, uh, by filling in uh, a bit on the perspective that we take uh, in the work that we're doing. To apply the kind of cognitive and organizational science tools we're using, it helps to understand a little bit about what's known of the psychology of expertise, experts both individually and in teams. Particularly in a team setting, like primary care medical practice, the nature of expertise is in the organizational routines. It's in the way we do it here. It's in the way the, the Folks in a practice, the physicians, the nurses, the medical assistants, the staff, work together to get the knowledge-intensive work that they do done. It's also, to some extent, in the ability to change routines. So this, organizational routines, is often considered routine expertise, and the ability to change routines is adaptive expertise. Now, there's a whole literature on organizational routines and adaptability and so forth. I'm going to highlight a couple of key features that matter a lot for the kind of work we're trying to do. One is that these organizational routines often contain quite a bit of tacit and dispersed knowledge. Tacit knowledge is things people know that they don't necessarily realize they know and that are important for doing the kind of work they're doing. Dispersed knowledge is knowledge, either explicit or tacit, 
that some members of the team have, but it's not shared across all members of the team. Different team members may depend on that knowledge being used by someone else on the team, but because they don't have that knowledge themselves, they may not have a clear picture of what it is or how it works. And so misunderstandings can arise there, particularly when you change a routine, when you disturb the way things are done, and then you discover that somebody thought, oh, I thought you always did this. And that's not really quite an accurate picture, but it didn't matter in the previous way of doing things. Now it does. This issue of, of the nature of knowledge work in which there is a lot of non-observable behavior and a lot of tacit knowledge has been one of the great challenges in trying to transfer expertise in taking the knowledge of, of an individual expert or a team and using that to train other teams. It's been something that's been observed for a long time in a wide range of disciplines. Uh, the, the notion of best practices sharing where a, a team that's high functioning is interviewed and their knowledge is captured and then you try to use that information to train another team to perform well also has often fallen flat, frankly. And that's why the techniques of cognitive task analysis were, were developed. It turns out we're not actually very good at introspection. We're not as good as we think we are at revealing our own tacit knowledge. We, we don't really understand in, in a sense that can be verbalized readily how we do what we do. And especially for experts, the better we are at it, the less we understand it explicitly and the more of our knowledge is locked up in tacit knowledge. And so attempts to just introspect, ask teams how they work, watch what they do, et cetera, and transfer that often come up short. But there are ways to address that. Uh, let's see, I'm going to move here. All Dr. Right. Green, shall I advance the slides for you? Uh, never mind. I figured out what the problem was, I think. There we go. If I'm in pointer mode, it won't let me move. Okay. So the techniques that were developed are called cognitive task analysis. It's a, actually a large family of highly structured qualitative methods, um, combining interview, observation, et cetera, um, that, is, that are used to understand the cognitive components of a task, and in particular, that are developed to be able to ferret out these hidden or non-observable kinds of behaviors, tacit knowledge, et cetera. It's not a novel thing by any means. It goes back to the 70s and 80s and has been used widely in, in disciplines like aviation, nuclear power plant operation, naval ship command, fire ground command, et cetera, places where, there, where teams of experts have to apply pretty high levels of knowledge under time pressure and usually with high stakes. Cognitive task analysis is not like behavioral task analysis. It's really a technique that's designed primarily for cognitive, com cognitively complex tasks. It's a knowledge work kind of thing. It, it's, not, it's not for every kind of, of workflow, but it's extremely useful for workflow analysis where you have a lot of this tacit knowledge going on. So, okay, it's doing it again. Can, can you advance the slide one for me? For some reason, it's ignore. Oh no, there it went. For some reason, it wants to ignore my my uh, arrows. Okay, so the features of, that we're looking for in particular when we try to take apart how these work routines and primary care work are what are called macrocognition. Those are things like decision-making and learning, sense-making, especially group sense-making, and building a shared mental model, a shared understanding of how the task, whatever that may be, is done. The processes of planning and replanning and coordinating, as well as monitoring and problem detection. How do you know when it's working? What do you do about it when it's not? Managing uncertainty and managing risk, often proactively. So these are the kinds of skills that go into high-level knowledge work. 
Our particular project was to apply cognitive task analysis methods in three federally qualified health centers um, in, uh, in the state of Michigan. Our first challenge was to identify the macrocognitive skills and functions that were used in the clinical care routine, that is the, the, the work of patient care. Find the decision points, find how information is handled, find those workarounds, and find where things go off the rails or might go off the rails because there's dispersed knowledge that may not be held by others, and when you try to change things, it could and you could discover that you, uh, that you had a pothole you didn't know about. The second was a higher order challenge, and that is to identify the macrocognitive skills and functions involved in the organizational change routines, involved in these practices' ability to implement something new. So we set out to do the observations and interviews, and from these, compile a detailed cognitive task analysis consult report for the practices. We then deliver the report, and the practices would use that information to help guide their implementation of some health IT. In, in this particular case, it's the Cielo Clinic System, which is a, a disease registry that also produces clinical reminders for preventive services and for disease management services, like, you know, getting people people with diabetes, their foot exams, and following up on cardiac patients, whether they're taking aspirin and so forth. It also does uh, report generation, uh, performance metrics, et cetera, and provides panel management support. So the registry can produce a list of patients with diabetes whose A1Cs are out of control, or patients with high blood pressure whose last blood pressure wasn't ideal or whatever. So it can be used for a number of these things. It's basically, it's a clinical quality management system. It is disruptive of organizational routines. It requires a new way to do things. So the idea was that our report would provide knowledge to the practices that would allow them to both address their work routines and their change routines and implement this health IT, hopefully more successfully with fewer PDSA cycles, not hitting as many potholes, easier, lower cost, and less disruptive, by really finding the potholes in advance, if you will. And then we'd set out to evaluate the usefulness of the reports to see if, in fact, they achieved that end. So a cognitive task analysis report is something that outlines the workflow itself. And it, it looks a, a fair bit like the workflow diagrams in, uh, in, the, in Pascal's presentation just now. But it specifically highlights macrocognition functions that are going on in there. It looks where the coordination is happening, where the communication is happening. It looks where sense making is necessary, where planning and replanning is done and so forth. It specifically tries to ferret out the tacit knowledge that people aren't aware that they have, that the routines depend on, and the dispersed knowledge that isn't shared across the group because when the work routines are disturbed by the introduction of this new health IT, those areas, those, those areas of tacit and dispersed knowledge, those may be where, where trouble happens and wasn't necessarily anticipated. The idea then is to provide a set of recommendations in, in considerable detail for the workflow changes and the organizational changes that are necessary, taking into account what we've discovered in terms of tacit and, and dispersed knowledge to try to solve some of these problems before they even come up. It gets down to the level of providing a very detailed set of implementation tools, a sequence of recommended changes, a logging function, support for, for the problem detection and the monitoring kinds of functions. Uh, in other words, uh, basically a, a sort of a cognitive form of, of PDSA cycles and helping make the need for that explicit upfront. So our particular study was a sequential case comparison. Again, it was three sites in which, uh, in, in which we implemented one after another with enough time space between them to learn a lot from each one so that we could apply that learning to do a better job for the next one. 
These were limited resource settings. They were rural FQHCs uh, living uh, pretty close to the bone in terms of uh, financial resources. If you want to look up in the references, it's more than we can get into right now, but the specific uh, CTA methods that we used, and there are dozens, were the task diagram and the team audit. The task diagram does look a great deal like the, uh, the activity version, <laughs> certainly not the prescribed task version of, uh, of what Pascal was showing, but again with a number of annotations and so forth. The team audit is more of a deep dive into the into the tacit knowledge, the dispersed knowledge, and the explicit knowledge that the team has. We completed these both at the clinical routines and the change management level, so the, the, the actual workflow and the organizational level, delivered the report, and then followed up with the, the sites as they used its recommendations and implemented the health IT in question. We then gathered information on how they used the reports, how well the implementation went, and what suggestions and thoughts they had. So, what did we find when we went out in the field? Well, first, we found that cognitive task analysis methods were readily applied at both the organizational and the operational levels. This was useful because although CTA has been uh, used pretty widely in other industries, uh, we are the first group to really be applying it in primary care. So we wanted to see if, if in fact, it, it is workable. Does it help? Um, and one of the things we found is not only does it work pretty well, but it did turn up what we thought. We found things that we didn't suspect just by observation or by asking people, and we found things that they didn't suspect. In fact, we had a great quote from, from the first site we looked at where after we had gone through and done pretty detailed uh, analysis of their workflow and and fed it back to them, they uh, even before we were done with the report, they, they came to us and said, you know what, this has been great therapy. We learned a lot about how we're doing things. So that was very, very useful to hear. And we heard versions of that comment at all three sites. In particular, we found a lot of dispersed knowledge. A lot of these practices depend on each other to do things without really quite understanding what each other are doing. And therein lies the potential for surprises. It did make significant deficits in organizational change skills, in organizational change capacity evident as well. We found some pretty substantial issues in coordination, in group sense making, in mental models of how the practice worked that were not shared across the organizations or where different groups of people had very different mental models of how the practice actually worked. And it wasn't too many. So in the individual practices, what we found, practice A at the organizational level had some pretty extensive deficits, really, in planning and coordination they, as a result, were not really able to act on the report that we gave them or use the, the proposed remedies that were, that were offered. They actually failed in the implementation. They launched and they ran the health IT for several months before ultimately giving up on it because they just couldn't get everyone on the same page and get it, get it to work for them in a way that they could sustain. They were using it and they were getting results from it. But it was very effortful, and they, they were not able to shift their work routines in a way that, that allowed it to become the new way we do things. And so they ultimately gave up on it. In practice B, we found they had very good planning and replanning skills. This was, a this was a, a FQHC that existed in a very disruptive external context, financially very hard-pressed, very limited resources, high turnover, difficult to access good personnel in their area, et cetera. And, and essentially, they, despite this very disruptive context, um, they have developed a very high level of management of uncertainty and risk management and problem detection and monitoring skills and the ability to plan and replan effectively. And so they were able to continue through with the implementation 
despite being in this very disruptive context. Practice C, we found, had very good coordination skills, good shared mental models, but very limited skills in planning and replanning and in problem detection and monitoring. They had actually tried to implement this health IT already before they joined our project. And by working with them on the on, on these skills, we were providing the feedback, we were actually able to improve those skills and they were able to relaunch it successfully. So I'm going to spend just a moment on this. It's uh, Weiner's model of uh, change management. The key thing here is that readiness is essentially a function of the valence, which is the value people, do people see value in the proposed change, and the the, uh, the team's assessment of their own ability to deal with implementing this change. It is in evaluating the context properly and evaluating the team's ability to handle it that CTA can help understand the readiness uh, of, of the group to pull off the change most effectively. So what, we've, what our lessons learned basically amounted to were First, understand organizational routines as knowledge work, as a form of expertise, including the fact that they contain extensive knowledge that's not observable and isn't readily accessible to introspection. You can't just ask people. You have to know how to ask them right. And determine whether the IT actually passes the right information to the right places. Oftentimes, where the information is really used isn't where people think it's being used. It turns out to be quite important to understand the team's macrocognitive skills profile and develop remedies for any deficits there before trying to launch the change. If we had really fully understood that, we might have either been able to do better with Site A or we might have just had to tell Site A, you know what, you guys aren't ready for this yet, Don't, let's not do it. Um, whereas when we actually did attempt an intervention, to boost the macrocognitive skills of a particular site, it worked and they were able to succeed there. And it's still thinking about whether it wants to click. All right, one more try. There we go. And that's my contact information with that. I will pass it over to Paulina. You're up next. Is that? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Dr. Green. I believe you have it. Good Our afternoon. Third... Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Our third presenter this afternoon is Dr. Paulina Sokolo, who has been trained in the field of health informatics and health policy and management at the National Library of Medicine. Robert Boo Johnson Foundation Public Health Informatics Fellow at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. In an effort to comprehensively evaluate health IT, she uses the principles of informatics and health services research and evaluation. She employs a mixed methods approach using an evidence-based health IT evaluation framework to integrate quantitative and qualitative signing. Her research involves evaluating health IT in community settings. Dr. Sokolo? Thank you. So I'll be presenting um, our study and the findings, and the title of the talk is The Barriers and Facilitators to Electronic Health Record Adoption in Home Care. So home care is important and very different from a hospital setting, and it's growing in use as the population ages. It is an increasingly effective way of managing chronic illness using skilled nursing care. It's ordered at hospital discharge or by the primary care provider. And unlike care in the hospital, home care involves a clinician visiting the patient who is homebound in their home following discharge over the course of 60 days at, in, at various intervals where the uh, clinician operates independently in the home. 
We wanted to look at the use of electronic health records in home care because electronic health records, or EHRs, are intended to enable clinicians' access to patient health information. And there's a high EHR adoption rate in home care, about 29%. However, little is known about EHR impact on clinical process or patient care. So the aims of the study were to identify the barriers and facilitators to use as intended of a home care, point of care, EHR. Our invet we investigated before and after the EHR implementation, and our rationale for the study was that identified barriers could be addressed and facilitators supported with interventions, such as redesign of software or to recommend implementation strategies. Also, that assessing EHRs that are used as intended enables assessment of EHR impact on the quality of care as opposed to trying to compare EHRs that are used in ways that involve workarounds and we're not comparing similar EHRs. Briefly, the study setting population and intervention is the home care agency was in Philadelphia. It had 137 clinicians, predominantly nurses, who provided and documented care in the EHR. We also pulled data for all Medicare patients from the EHR. And the EHR was a commercial system. It was implemented as a point of care. The point of care version was implemented in 2010. And before that was an EHR, earlier version of the EHR, in which nurses and clinicians' notes were transcribed into the EHR. And that provided the pre-implementation data. So briefly looking at our mixed methods research design, it has three parts. At the top in the pink rectangle is the quantitative design, which was the primary data source. Below it in the oval is the qualitative design, and on the right is the mixed methods analysis. In the center of the diagram are a series of X's and an O and more X's, which is the health services research depiction of the research design, where the X indicates observations, in this case meaning data collection, and the O is the intervention. So as you can see, the quantitative design had data collection before and after the intervention. After the intervention, we administered a clinician satisfaction survey and before and after the intervention, we collected data um, uh, regarding EHR usage, documentation completion, and reimbursement. And the data, all, this quantitative data was analyzed using longitudinal analysis. In the qualitative component, which was the secondary uh, data source, we looked at EHR functionality, we observed selected clinicians, and we administered follow-up interviews with those clinicians, and we analyzed the qualitative data using thematic analysis. In the mixed methods analysis over in the box over to the right, we linked the qualitative data with the quantitative data, and we integrated the quantitative data, the quantitative outcomes with the qualitative findings. In a little bit more depth, looking at the mixed methods design, we, the quantitative component included a survey to assess clinician perceptions or satisfaction with characteristics of the EHR. The survey is called the EHR Nurse Satisfaction Survey the urns, and it was administered post-implementation. The survey is available in the ARC toolbox. And the survey is a validated instrument with 22 items and a six-point liquor type response. We also 
pulled data regarding EHR usage from the document from the uh, actual documents, looking at documentation completion timeliness. This is ex extracted from the clinical note documentation, and we apply statistical analysis looking at the proportion of clinicians who completed their note within the agency's compliance guidelines. We also pulled from the EHR patient outcome data. Uh, patient health status data is documented in an instrument called the OASIS, which is required for Medicare reimbursement, making this a reliable and valid uh, data source. The data is collected by the nurse or the therapist who observes or asks the patient or care, their caregiver about the patient's health status. They, the clinician documents in the EHR at admission every 60 days and at discharge. They document the OASIS. At, for this data, we apply logistic regression analysis to compare patient status decline versus no change or improvement because their aged patients were expecting decline. And then in the mixed methods analysis, we included qualitative data to gain a rich description of the clinician's perspective. We observe the clinicians documenting during the patient visit. These uh, clinicians were selected using work sampling um, to select by role, and we interviewed clinicians who were observed. I'm sorry, I'm talking about the qualitative component. And then in the mixed methods analysis, we sorted the results by data source. A data source would be the interview, observation, a survey, or the data um, from the EHR, and we uh, sorted the data by theme, and we summarized the themes in a matrix to pull the information together. So our results, the demographics of our population. We had 77 clinicians who consented to the study, which is 56% of the eligible population. 71 clinicians responded to the survey. These were mostly experienced, middle-aged female clinicians. They were mostly nurses and then uh, some therapists, both physical therapists and occupational therapists. And 35% of the respondents had prior EHR experience. We observed and interviewed six clinicians. So we had results that fell into three categories. Results where there was concordance across all methods and concordance regarding either satisfaction or dissatisfaction. And we had results where there was discordance and results that were neutral. So looking at the concordant results regarding clinician satisfaction, uh, and this is organized by theme. So the first theme is computer hardware. We, uh, the, the data indicated that there was inadequate battery power for the hardware, which caused clinicians to have to note on paper. The next theme was EHR data completeness, correctness, and timeliness. The data indicated that there was timely documentation, and for the most part, the data was complete that was in the EHR with the exceptions of medications, hospital stay history, and the physician contact information. The next theme was appropriateness of patient care. The consensus was that the EHR displayed patient information that was needed for the care decision or to initiate conversation with the patient at the right time in the right place. And the fourth theme was team communication, that the EHR facilitated team communication. We, then the next category was where we saw discordance among the data methods. Specifically, clinicians tend to record, it, to record on their surveys satisfaction in most areas, yet the interviews indicated dissatisfaction. And the themes where this occurred were organizational support regarding the need for field support, 
So the surveys indicated, indicated that need. The next thing was software usability. Although clinicians reported satisfaction on the survey, the interviews and observations were, um, indicated that there was poor screen flow for finding information or entering data and poor information display in the EHR. The next thing was software functionality. An example of poor functionality was the care plan documentation was cumbersome and redundant. And the fourth thing was efficiency. With, the, at the, with using the point of care system, the clinicians now needed to complete about 100 OASIS questions, where pre-implementation they were documenting by exception. Then we had the category of consensus regarding clinician dissatisfaction. And there were two areas. One was training, and what was highlighted was the need for ongoing training. And the second area was unintended consequences. A couple of clinicians felt that opening the laptop between them and the patient disrupted their rapport with the patient. And the last category was uh, neutral results across all methods. And this was regarding patient outcomes, the EHR's impact on patient outcomes. And in fact, when we looked at the patient outcome data pulled from the EHR, the EHR had some impact on only some patient outcomes and not all. So we did observe some change management during this study. And this was in the area of quality assurance and performance improvement. The agency's management used secondary data from the EHR to discuss with clinicians the timeliness of their documentation to nudge them towards compliance with the agency's timeliness guidelines. This, in turn, increased the clinician's documentation productivity and improved the timeliness and the completeness of the documentation. So putting our findings into context, we'll begin with the hardware issues. That knowing that home care nurses travel and lack access to the central office where the uh, IT support is, they need backup hardware or on-site technical support. However, because they have less than reliable or maybe unusable hardware, this increased their workload and decreased their efficiency due to duplicate documentation on paper and then again in the EHR. And the next area was the mismatch between functionality and workflow, which actually decreased the clinician's efficiency while we saw an increased use of the EHR by clinicians. We also saw that the, there was a difference between the clinical disciplines and how they organized documentation, which uh, translated into a, a mismatch. For instance, the EHR was organized by body systems, which matched how nurses documented, but it did not match how therapists document, who, and they document by body position. So they'll do the, ass the assessments or the therapies as the patient is sitting first, and they'll document that. Then they'll ask the patient to change position and document in the new position, and the EHR did not support that. We did see um, EH, that the clinician's uh, EHR use as intended resulted in a sustained increase in documentation timeliness and affected data availability. It reduced the, the time needed for the clinicians to locate and collate information and supported team communication and captured the quality, and the EHR captured quality data for process improvement. We also saw a need for ongoing training, that there were, um, the clinicians needed to know better ways to document so, that, so as to eliminate the redundant documentation and improve their efficiency. 
This is especially important for clinicians who practice independently in the home. They have few opportunities to learn from colleagues about new and faster ways to use the EHR to get their work done because they don't see them. There are opportunities to provide clinicians with feedback from the EHR data that we, that we observed. As we, met, as we mentioned, the management currently provides documentation, timeliness, and compliance data back to the clinicians. We also saw opportunities to share patient care process and health outcome data. Doing so would support quality assurance and care management efforts on the part of management. And this, in turn, may impact patient outcomes where the EHR has had some impact. And doing so, we feel clinicians would, would uh, make clinicians more likely to value the system if the, they see that the system supports their patient care goals, they may be more likely to use the EHR as intended. And those are our recommendations. So we, there was effective change management observed during the study. The current efforts improved the quality of the Clinician Oasis documentation. Uh, change management was used to minimize barriers. It provided clinicians with timely feedback from the EHR data, increased the documentation productivity, and improved the timeliness and the completeness of the documentation. This um, and the change management also created a positive impact on team communication. The use of the EHR created a positive impact on team communication. Because clinicians obtain patient data from the EHR and because the EHR data is complete and reliable. This in turn reduced phone calls among clinicians to request patient information, which reduced interruptions to clinicians during patient care. So, in conclusion, we saw opportunities for effective change management. These included creating and acting on data from operational feedback systems. It's possible that the IT department is collecting hardware maintenance data regarding IT support, and this data could be analyzed to prioritize and then address the need for field support. Another opportunity is to elicit and respond to feedback from clinicians. For instance, management could ask clinicians how to improve workflow or EHR functionality um, and the match to improve their efficiency. And this information could be acted on by um, the agency taking on ways to improve the functionality EHR match, and what they can't improve, turning those suggestions over to the vendor and asking for changes to be made. A third area it was to implement continuous training, and this should be for all clinicians, not just nurses. Agencies that tend to be predominantly nurses are likely to have a nurse educator, yet all clinicians would benefit from training. And this training content should be both about uh, system updates as they occur and also about shortcuts that would enable clinicians to improve their efficiency. And uh, with that, that concludes my talk. And before I say goodbye, I want to acknowledge the co-authors of the study, Kathy Bowles at Penn, Marguerite Adelsberger now at Abington Hospital, Cindy Lau at Temple, and Jesse Chittams at Penn. And now I'll turn it over. This is my contact information, and I'll turn it back to Teresa for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sokolow. We'd now like to move to the question and answer portion of the teleconference. Please submit your questions using the Q&A box to the right of your screen. And we already have a few questions. The first one is for Dr. Carrion. This attendee would like for you to talk a little bit about what techniques do you recommend for managing expectations when implementing a new system, um, particularly because seasoned analysts and product team members know that school life is the start of optimization. 
what end users might expect a nearly perfect product. Uh, thank you, Teresa, and, and thank you to uh, the person who submitted that question. I saw it when it came uh, when it came in, and I think this is a great uh, question. That very often we think about uh, change management as the big thing that's coming, and we need to get ready for it. And then, oh, finally it's over. Then now we can relax, and and things will be will be fine. Uh, and the question is really about how do we change those expectations and those uh, perceptions uh, that we know the uh, technology implementation might just be the beginning of a process of uh, continuous change and system redesign, process improvement, practice redesign, uh, implementation of new ways of caring for patients, of interacting with patients, and so on. Uh, and so as I thought about that question, I've got a kind of couple of uh, ideas. I think one is we need to start changing the way we talk about uh, the health IT implementation. Uh, and like I said, very often we talk about it, oh, it's going to be a big change. Make sure you're ready. We're going to allocate uh, you more time so that you can get used to it. And then we're going to hire extra staff. They are going to be the green vest or the red vest or whatever color vest those people are going to have. Uh, and this is very often how we talk about it, why we need to change how we talk about it. Uh, otherwise, this is what end users are going to expect. Uh, and if we change the way we talk about it uh, and talk about uh, that implementation really as a beginning of, of a continuous change uh, process, actually end users may be relieved. I mean, they may be happy to, to know that uh, things may not work out very well at the beginning, but this is okay. I don't expect it to be perfect. Uh, I may need more time. Uh, so the way we talk about it, the way we um, also allocate resources, if we're telling users we're going to do um, help you a lot during maybe a couple of weeks right after the implementation, but then you're on your own, that's not going to fly. And so talking about that process as, as a continuous learning and improvement uh, process. So it really has to do with that culture of uh, learning. Um, and um, Dean, if you could move to the slide, I think it must be slide 15 uh, in my presentation that had that table on episodic change and continuous change. Um, that actually describe what is it that's needed for the, yeah, thank you, Dean, what's needed for continuous change. And you're going to see that it's a whole new different set of activities that are really more organized around individual and organizational learning. Uh, and so what is it that we can uh, learn and, and use that uh, learning from these different changes and, and go through those loops of uh, continuous improvement? Um, so maybe we should just not talk about tech, uh, SIT implementation. I'm sorry, I'm throwing a, um, a wrench in the, in the discussion here. But we're really talking about system redesign or performance improvement. Uh, so again, in the way we're talking about it, um, that I think really affects the way people think about it. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Dr. Green. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the process for obtaining tacit and dispersed knowledge? Yes. Okay. So I, I typed a, a message in the Q&A box as well. I'll describe it a little bit more in detail. It's a set of, of probing techniques that are used in one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, and when doing observations in uh, asking people questions during the direct observation. It's derived really from, from work in social psychology, and it, it requires uh, quite a bit of training. The techniques are described pretty well in some of the references that if you look up cognitive task analysis, you'll find them. A good one is a book called Working Minds, uh, which is uh, Crandall, Klein, and Hoffman. And I'll, uh, I'll dig up that reference and post it uh, in the text thing in just a minute. Um, George Paparowski, one of my colleagues, and I, uh, also wrote an article on this for the ARC uh, change support methods series that was referenced earlier 
Um, and it's, it's titled uh, Cognitive Task Analysis. So if you look at that, you'll see uh, more about the specific techniques as well. Uh, basically, it's, a, it's a, a, a very detailed form of questioning that, that takes a fair bit of practice to master. Uh, our field staff who do this uh, spend, oh, typically anywhere from 45 to 90 minutes with any given individual. We lay out a set of probe questions, a framework in advance, and these are folks who are master's level mostly social science backgrounds, but we do have some who are um, even operations, research, industrial engineering backgrounds, but they're, they're pretty experienced folks. And it, even then, it, it takes a while to learn how to do the probing. It, it also requires a pretty substantial understanding of macrocognition uh, and, and of the theoretical grounding of this. It's, it's not something you can do by a template. It certainly can't be done by just questionnaires. It's a very interactive uh, sort of a sort of an approach. Thank you, Dr. Green. And I know one attendee has asked to see a sample of the CTA report. We're working on trying to show that via the WebEx. In the meantime, um, there is a question for Dr. Sokolo. If folks are interested in getting a copy of the survey that she used for her study. They can email her directly and ask for it. Her in contact information was shown in one of the slides, and it will be available when the final slides are, are posted online in a couple of weeks. Okay, and it looks like we're working on, on getting that CCA report shown. That's it. So what you'll see here on the screen then is a, uh, a version where the names are changed to protect the innocent, guilty, and uh, random bystanders uh, from one of the sites that we did. You will see when you look through this that it doesn't, this is our research team here, uh, it does not include any of the macrocognition terms that I used. We're using those in our own analysis, but that's not particularly helpful to the clinic. We are much more concrete in our recommendations uh, for the clinic and focus more on what they want to do. This is just the preamble. It's part two. This is just a, sort of a gross overview here. It's really, the, it's really the part two document that has, I think, what people are going to want to see. Okay, so this is the step zero, and in this particular document that I sent along, we don't have the actual flow chart. It's it kind of too big and doesn't come across on the screen very well. But we've gone through the specific steps, the highlighted the dispersed knowledge and highlighted the uh, places where we've identified things that may fall through the gap uh, and then made specific suggestions for what to do about them at each stage of the workflow. So what you'll see, this is, the, this is the part that's specifically about the actual workflow. And then the organization level begins here, if you want to skip back one page. Um, this is the beginning of the organization level recommendations. Here's where we really get into the team's ability to, to to coordinate, build shared mental models, do shared sense making, uh, manage uncertainty, detect problems, replan, and so forth. And you'll see here, for example, how guidelines are chosen. That comes out of our assessment of their sense making and shared mental models, how changes are decided. That's fairly, fairly evident in terms of their you know, planning and, and decision making kind of stuff. And so we've gone through and, and in this case, pointed out where the challenges in this, in this team's, uh, basically their change capacity, if you want to think of it that way, um, where those challenges lie and what might need to be done to help them succeed in, in the implementation.
and this is just a specific sequence that we laid out for them to, uh, you know, okay, do this, do this, do this kind of, uh, kind of activities. Um, although, and this is something we just, uh, one of several kinds of documents that we created. One of the challenges in this particular site was that they didn't have very good coordination or joint sense making. And so we gave them a worksheet to try to get them all into one place and really to try to get them to do joint sense making and understand where their dispersed knowledge and where the differences in their sense making were is really a sort of a spur to get them to consider some of the, the challenges that they were up against. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Green, for sharing that, and, and Dean, thank you for making that happen. Um, moving on, um, I'd like to put a question to Dr. Sokolo. Regarding the finding related to the need for ongoing training, what were examples of the specific deficits and opportunities that you found? Well, let's see. Can you hear me? So the deficits for ongoing training were particular to home care agencies or to the home care agency we observed because the clinicians act independently in the home. So changes that were made to the software system, to the EHR, in terms of regular upgrades were not communicated effectively. Um, other deficits were, as I mentioned, that some nurses found ways to accomplish their documentation with less uh, duplicate documentation, less keystrokes in a more efficient way. And there wasn't a venue or a communication method for them to communicate this information to their colleagues. So the information tended to reside with the nurse unless they happened to meet up at um, a monthly staff meeting, which was attended by about a quarter of the staff. So the information didn't flow among clinicians either. And so we had, those were the two major areas, were the upgrades and how to do their work more efficiently. Great, thank you, Dr. Sokolo. Um, I'd like to turn now to Dr. Carrion and then maybe a follow-on to Dr. Lee. Dr. Carrion, can you describe practical human factors methods to analyze workflow in anticipation of health AT implementation? Um, and talk a little bit about um, what methods you think would be best in contrast between some methods. Um, so Dr. Green uh, talked about one uh, type of uh, methods that uh, look at um, cognitively complex uh, work. Um, and so I think those are very appropriate uh, methods uh, to look at uh, work and work flow in anticipation of uh, SIT. And like Dr. Green suggest, uh, indicated earlier, those methods really require um, um, experience and expertise uh, in order to produce um, useful um, and high quality data. I think there are other uh, methods, maybe more simple um, methods uh, that are really part of the traditional uh, quality improvement systems engineering uh, toolbox. Um, for instance, uh, doing um, some observations and maybe some um, interviews or group interviews, focus group to understand uh, a process and then flow charting it. Um, I think what's, um, what's important is, uh, I think a point I was making uh, earlier, it's pretty rare when a single method gets you what you need. And so you need to think about different ways of collecting data, for instance, 
interviews and observations or survey and interviews uh, and the presentations by Dr. Green and by Dr. Sokolo, I think, show some really good examples of combining different methods. So different methods of collecting data as well as different methods of analyzing or representing uh, data, uh, uh, representing data in tables, in graphs, in uh, some other some other visual means. Um, and so I think it's important for people to think about using those uh, different types of methods and understanding their respective strengths and weaknesses and using a combination that allows the weaknesses of one method to be compensated by the strength of the other method. Thank you, Dr. Carrion. And then, um, Dr. Lee, as a follow-on, can you talk a little bit more about um, CTA and how it's different from lean and other business process for engineering types of analysis? Yes, certainly. Um, actually, CTA and lean work quite well together, and this is one of the things we've been doing in our work recently. Uh, CTA is a tool. It's not a replacement for lean or an alternative to it, quite the opposite. Applying the macrocognition perspective and using the tools of cognitive task analysis allow you to generate a much more accurate current state map if you're using lean, allow you to get a much better picture on what you need to do to accomplish your future state. It's, again, it's, it's a tool set that, that helps you extend lean from its roots, which are actually in highly observable processes in manufacturing, into the much less observable work of knowledge work. But it, it's quite complementary. It's not an alternative to lean. And again, as, uh, as we just heard, it's, it's a specific tool. It's useful for knowledge work. It's important to use when you're doing things that, when you're looking at things that are cognitively complex. It's much too much work and expense and effort to go to for, you know, simple workflows that are, that are readily observable. Uh, if you want to see what people are doing with an EMR, the best thing to do is watch them do what they do. But then if you need to start getting into the work routines and understanding the way they process the information, then you may need to something like cognitive task analysis. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, seeing as uh, we have no additional questions, we'll wrap up a few minutes early. I want to thank our three presenters again, and thank you uh, to everybody who attended and those who asked questions. Just as a reminder, please fill out the evaluation form when you log out. And as we said previously, materials will be available in two weeks on the ARC Health IT website under the events section. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>